This is Matt. Uh, you can read some things about me there on the screen. Uh, I've been passionate about software delivery for my whole career, and I've had the good fortune to find a place here at ThoughtWorks where that passion gets nurtured, developed, and challenged really every single day. Uh, Ten years ago, I had a, a kind of a unique opportunity to help start our first offshore delivery center in Bangalore. And so I jumped at that opportunity, and uh, as, it, as it played out, I've spent really much of the subsequent 10 years, the past 10 years, working with distributed teams, um, you know, making mistakes and, and learning. And I've had an awful lot of fun along the way. Uh, that's actually a um, different and more interesting picture of me. I'm the guy on the horse in the middle. Um, as Clyde says, I live in Chicago, but somewhat, somewhat fittingly, I guess, for this webinar, it turned out I had to be in Bangalore this week. So we're going to deliver this in, in this webinar itself as a distributed event. And one consequence of that is, at times, the phones can drop, as you know, if you've worked with, um, with, with teams out of India. It's pretty late here, and traffic is, is low, so I don't really think that's going to happen. Uh, but if it is, does happen, please be patient. I'll, I'll be right back with you as soon as I can dial back in. And Clyde has promised to tell some really great jokes to keep you entertained in, in the event of an emergency like that. Right, so here's a quick agenda of what we're going to cover today. We've done the introductions. Uh, I'd like to we'll kind of talk about why the, the trend towards distributed development is, is just continuing to increase and gather momentum um, more and more every year. Uh, we'll talk about some of the things that make that hard and introduce a concept called distributed agile, which at face value might sound like an oxymoron. We'll spend really the, we'll kind of whiz through those first first three, but the real meat of the talk is there at the bottom. Uh, we're going to share some strategies and, and tactics that we've developed here uh, at ThoughtWorks, so working with lots of different customers that, that can help you be more effective with your distributed teams. And there will be time for questions at the end. The real hope of the entire journey is that you leave here today with an appreciation of the importance of building out um, a capability to, to manage and, and execute global delivery. Uh, we hope you get a, a kind of a more sophisticated framework than, you know, where the developer is cheapest to help you plan your global delivery strategy. Uh, and we hope to share some specific tactics that you can employ today, this afternoon, next week, uh, that will help you employ, improve your execution in your distributed software development efforts. I've been giving this talk for probably close to 10 years now, and uh, I've, you know, certainly the trend towards more and more distribu distributed delivery from, from my perspective is, has accelerated um, more and more every single year. Uh, it, you know, it all it all kind of started uh, with labor arbitrage early, you know, in the late 90s and, and early 2000s. Um, and, and, but it's really gone much beyond that now. And, and there's all these trends are kind of coming together to uh, force more and more of, of our projects to be executed with people who, who don't spend very much time next to one another. Uh, two of the more recent ones, I think, that, that we're seeing, you know, labor arbitrage is <laughs> it's not even much of an arbitrage anymore. Um, but access to talent uh, and experience seems to be really one of the major forces driving, at least from, from our perspective. And the globalization of, of, of everyone's business and the fact that, you know, uh, large, large opportunities exist in lots of places around the world and, and uh, companies are, are getting much better at, at, at going after that opportunity wherever it may be. Those, those are the two on this list that we see really driving the, the major growth um, today, uh, which is slightly different than, than some of the forces in the past. The fact of the matter is, if you you know think about software delivery as a supply chain, you know, when you talk about distributed delivery, there's still kind of a tendency, I think, to uh, go directly to offshore, right, and then and equate distributed with offshore. But looking at this picture, even if you remove the offshore jigsaw piece, uh, you you might have you might have domain experts, you might have different critical pieces of of what it takes to get your software delivered scattered all over the place. And so the fact of the matter is. Uh, the default and, and the way that software gets built today um, is is really distributed, and I would therefore argue that you know learning to make distributed collaboration work is <coughs> really a, going to become more and more of a, a core capability that your organization needs to have to succeed in, uh, and compete uh, in, in going forward. And unfortunately, I, I think I'd argue that a lot of organizations haven't really. Realize this um, to, a certain, to as much as they need to, and they haven't invested in developing that capability, and so they're not going to be really ready for the special changes that distributed software development and distributed collaboration uh, bring to bear. Today, I'm <clears throat> going to share a lot of things that we've learned over years of hard experience and lots of mistakes, 
uh, and hopefully it will help you and your organization accelerate the learning curves that you're on. We're going to share some best practices for outsourcing software development. I tell you what, if you don't look at that title and if your consultant alarm doesn't kind of start ringing and something smells a little bit funny, um, your consultant alarm is probably faulty. Uh, if you've been to a session <coughs> excuse me, uh, on a topic like this before, you've probably seen uh, advice like this from you know, kind of the talking heads. Uh, and you've probably heard recommendations like this. Uh, what you're going to hear today from, from me is going to sound a little bit different. In fact, it might sound exactly the opposite. Um, <clears throat> some of you will be familiar with George Costanza from the Seinfeld television show. There was an episode where George um, decided that he, he, his judgment, his internal judgment, had served him so poorly throughout his life that um, he may as well try an experiment. And whenever he felt strongly that he should do something, he would just do the opposite. And perhaps that would lead him to, uh, to better results. It's sort of, it's sort of some of the things we're, we're going to talk about here in a minute are going to sound a little bit like that. It's sort of counterintuitive. It's a very different perspective. And the reason our perspective or my perspective is different <clears throat> is that uh, we believe that software is built by people and built by teams. And so software development at its core is really a social process. Um, it's not an industrial process. It's not. It's not really even an engineering process. It's. It's really. Um, it, it, it's. It's really all about individuals and interactions. Uh, to, to quote a line uh, from a, from <laughs> somewhere that may be familiar to, to many of you. Uh, it's not about process, tools, and controls. And if you start changing your perspective to focus on uh, optimizing the quality of of the individuals you work with and the interactions that they have. Um, that leads to a really different set of recommendations from what you see here and what, what's kind of the prevailing wisdom. And um, we believe it leads to really different results as well. So if you accept, <coughs> excuse me, if you accept the theory that, you know, so software development is a, a social process, it sort of follows that you should look for ways to maximize social cohesion on your distributed teams, and you would then kind of expect the great results to, to flow from there naturally. Well, how do you do that? How do you increase social cohesion? Well, social cohesion, you know, we're all kind of a bunch of monkeys, and monkeys build social ties by communicating with one another. Um, so social cohesion is built on a foundation of communication. Maximize your communication. You should maximize cohesion. If, that, if that's the case, I've got some bad news for you. Here's a chart. Um, this was actually produced by a, a guy at, Mass at MIT a number of years ago, in the, in sometime in the late 70s. He did a lot of studies of... The, uh, how how workers in this in this case it was a research and development laboratory sort of uh, knowledge workers uh, how they communicate and how their frequency of communication is impacted by their physical proximity. Um, there's some interesting things that that I noticed from this this graph. One is um, <laughs> if you it's a logarithmic scale. So if you look up here, there's there's at the very beginning. Uh, the, the 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 zero point on the axis is people that sit one meter away from each other. So basically, the person sitting in the next seat over. Um, it turns out, at least in this in the studies that he did, there's only about a 60 or 70 percent chance that two people that sit within a meter of each other are going to have a, convers a conversation within a given week. <laughs> seems like a pretty low number, but you know they, they, he did some pretty thorough studies, and this pattern showed up again and again. Uh, it's also interesting how quickly the effective distance sets in. Uh, so, you know, as, in as little as, as 10 meters or as little as 100 meters, we've, we've dropped down to just 2 or 3% chance that the two people will communicate in a given week. So I think there's, there's, there's some interesting, interesting takeaways you can, you can draw from this. You may be experiencing the impacts of, of distributed development, even if you've just got a big workspace and somebody sits on one side of your floor and the other side of the floor let alone on a different floor or in a different building on the same campus or across town. And, it, you know, we're going to talk a lot through this uh, about extreme distributed situations, which are, you know, people working in different countries, thousands of miles and, and many time zones apart. But y y you might want to consider, if you're struggling with some of your delivery efforts, applying some of the techniques and tactics that we're going to recommend, uh, even if you're just working in, in different parts of, of a large uh, building or a large uh, campus. Because if you really look at this, this graph, there's this kind of an asymptote here. There's not much difference between uh, 100 meters and, and 10,000 meters. Now, it is fair to say, you know, this uh, this was done in the late 70s, and some things have changed since then, right? The, uh, they, there was um, there was no Facebook in the 70s. There was no instant messenger. Uh, it, it was pre you know pre-internet and all the lowering of barriers to communication. But 
if you really if you look at the rapid fall off over you know the distances where it's it's pretty easy to stand up and, and call out to someone or walk over to see them, I, I I'm not certain that Facebook is going to do much to bend this curve. Um, the fact of the matter is the old cliche, uh, you know, out of sight, out of mind. It's not just a cliche. And people who don't remain in close physical proximity just don't have a tendency to talk very often. But communication is really just an enabler. It's not your goal. It, your real goal um, is something, uh, a word that I like to use for it is intimacy. And um, I have to apologize for this, this picture. It's uh, a terrible photo, it looks like. <laughs> So PR agency, you know, tried to put together the ideal workforce picture. But I did a search on uh, the inter internet for intimacy photos, and that turned up some rather um, interesting options. So this was the best of kind of a bad lot. Yeah, the point here I'm trying to make is that in, um, intimate teams communicate richly. They they do that both inside and out of specific transactions or specific, uh, you know, the specific context of what they're talking about. It's not just about I ask you a question, you answer. It's I proactively provide your information that I think it would be helpful for you to know. Uh, intimate teams understand and, and respect one another. They, they look for opportunities to leverage each other's strengths um, and to support or cover for, for weaknesses. Um, the, uh, intimate teams are resilient, they're durable, they're flexible, productive, and, and they're fun. Um, if you, you know, many of you, I hope, have been on a high-performing software development team, and I, I think you'd agree, uh, a high-performing software development team is extremely intimate. It's an extremely intimate group of people, and that's kind of what makes it work. Uh, so, the, you know, the $60,000 question is, is it possible to have an intimate distributed software development team? Well, fortunately, I believe the answer is very much yes, and we'll spend the most of the rest of our time showing you exactly how to achieve that intimacy. There are, um, whoops, sorry, I've gone too soon. Um, there are sort of two, two categories of things you can do to increase uh, the intimacy level of your distributed teams. Uh, I call them structural structural things and tactical things. We're going to look first at a couple of real structural things that you can do about how you set up and structure your teams. Um, and then we're going to look at a bunch of practical things uh, that, in, that all serve the same end of, of increasing intimacy. Right, so if you happen to be based in uh, North America, you could draw a rough uh, plot like this of intimacy um, in, in, on an increasing trend line uh, with the least intimate being Asia and uh, going up all the way to North America. Uh, if you happen to be based in, say, Singapore, your order might be slightly different. And uh, it's, it's difficult to ask questions, I guess we're on a webinar, but some of you, uh, I'm sure, can guess what the biggest factor here that influences the order that, that particular regions of the world appear on the on the intimacy scale based on your home location. Um, any guesses? Um, yeah, it's time zones. Uh, you know, it's just really really difficult. Uh, you take you take all you look at that curve of, of you know the reluctance to talk to people, and if you reduce the time frame in which you're both awake and uh, you know in in a relatively alert state down to just a couple hours a day uh it just becomes an extremely high barrier to uh to overcoming the already high barrier <laughs> to communicate um after after time zones probably the next biggest factor um is probably uh is probably travel and the distance cost and overhead of 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 getting face to face uh when it's necessary you know, I think when people talk about uh, distributed teams, culture uh, and cultural differences get a lot of attention. Um, you know, I'm not so convinced that's a major factor. Most teams will kind of develop a strong culture of their own that sort of trumps the national or the company cultures, and you know, people will learn to work with one another. It might be surprising at first for the first few weeks, but people kind of figure it out. But you can't just figure out um, a 12-hour time zone difference, and so. Um, if you're looking um, for ways to, to um, maximize your structural intimacy, uh, thinking about the impact of the geographic and time zone uh, distribution that's going to result from where you place your teams or where you uh, choose to source your, your, your work or distribute your work uh, can, have a, can have a massive structural impact. Uh, for example, Canada to uh, Brazil is a lot more intimate than 
um, New York to Beijing. Uh, it's just it, it, it starts from a higher point of intimacy on this curve, and and then everything else you do to increase intimacy builds from there. Um, it's not impossible to make it work the other day, but the other way, but you have to work harder uh, against uh, to bend that curve um, and and increase your intimacy. Second kind of structural intimacy is is the, you know who is where and and how how you distribute teams. Um, one of the trends we talked about earlier is you know more and more globalization and companies spreading out all over the world. And one of the things that you know we've seen as a, as a fairly common pattern is you know organizations will try to consolidate capabilities um, by geographic location. And so you might end up in a situation here, um, which is <laughs> kindly labeled dysfunctional. But you, you might have three locations. You know, you're you've got a uh, a customer in. Rochester, New York. You've got uh, a, a development ex excellence center in in uh, in Delhi. You've got some testing center of excellence in Romania, uh, and and maybe you've got some some crack business analysts in San Francisco. Uh, and, I mean, each of those each of those sort of silos is going to be fighting against all those. Um, all those barriers to intimacy, just to establish intimacy with one other group, and of course, uh, software development requires, or especially complex software development requires, a high degree of, of interactivity and real-time collaboration, uh, or, or as close to real-time collaboration as you can with all these groups. So, um, this is a really, really difficult model to make work. Uh, one of one of the things that you know uh, we advise customers if they if they're needing uh, a lot more intimacy to make their specific problem work. Uh, one of the one of the things you can do to change, and they're not getting it. One of the things they can do to change the game is to shift the model, possibly to something that's a little bit more like this. Uh, you know, at least we're we're getting some groupings here. Um, there's relationships forming between developers and testers. There's tight real-time feedback loops that can happen between those two groups, and uh, you know, the same between customers and uh, business analysts or systems analysts, and then you really have to focus all of your efforts on increasing the, the connectivity and, and communication between two groups and, and, and that are intimate, in, internally intimate and then you know, creating intimacy across. Um, of course, you can guess the, the, the best and most effective is if you can really get uh, cross-functional, multifunctional teams um, and, and, and create uh, you know, standalone uh, highly, highly collaborative teams that we can then collaborate with with other remote teams. This, this is this is often the 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 best uh, method of of achieving a high degree of structural intimacy. Uh, it's not always possible, so you know, and it's not it's not absolutely necessary. But if you can move towards this, uh, it, it can it can be a really effective way of increasing the productivity and and quality that you're getting from your distributed teams. Right. So those are the sort of couple things you can do structurally. Um, everything else is uh, tactical. And uh, I've got bad news. There's there's really no silver bullet. Uh, in fact, there's uh, there's no there's not even five silver bullets. There's there's literally dozens of things uh, that you can do on a tactical basis to incrementally increase your your intimacy, uh, keep your team uh, communicating, keep things fresh and functional and fun. Um, we're going to spend most of the rest of our time here going over uh, a few of the the, the tactics um, that we found most effective to to increase in intimacy. And you know, as you probably can guess from these, these Dilbert cartoons, uh, we take a lot of inspiration from agile practices, and more importantly, from agile values as we as we try to create. Uh, and think what we can do um, to make our, our teams uh, work together a little bit better. And because just we've got a big diverse group, and um, agile is a term is kind of getting a broadening of its definition in the marketplace right now. I'm going to take just a, a couple of minutes here and make sure that I clarify what I mean when I talk about uh, when I mean when I talk about agile uh, and, and being inspired by agile. Um, you know, I think this is probably familiar to you. There's um, uh, a bunch of uh, practitioners of software uh, met about 10, 10 years ago, uh, almost 10 years ago, and they kind of all realized that they were trying to do the same thing, and they decided instead of fighting turf wars with one another, they'd, they'd create a kind of unified approach, an umbrella term, and join together uh, to achieve, uh, you know, more impact and greater good for the software industry. 
and uh, they called themselves, uh, they wrote this thing called the Manifesto, the Agile Manifesto, and um, it's really a value statement, and um, the picture is just a picture of the boys, but <laughs> if you look down at the bottom of the screen, that, that, that's the, the core values that are, that are stated in the Agile, Agile Manifesto. And as you're thinking about creative ways to uh, increase your intimacy and collaboration of your teams, think about things that um, make make things stronger on the left side of this and don't worry as much about some of the things on the right side. It doesn't mean the things on the right side aren't valid and, and you know, have their place, but it means that you'll probably get more bang for your buck in investing time and, and figure out ways to maximize, for example, individuals and, and their interactions. Uh, instead of really uh, trying to over over too, too much overkill on on process and tools, so we take a lot of inspiration from the from the agile values as we create custom uh, ways to increase intimacy on distributed teams. Um, we also, you know, when we talk about doing distributed agile, um, there is uh, an an element of agile that's really more on the the project management and communication side, and there's an element of agile that's really pretty hardcore. And pretty disciplined engineering practices. Um, the terms that are most closely associated with those are are um, extreme programming XP is, is some of the more of the the hardcore engineering practices, which are represented by the the blue circle on the in, inside here. <clears throat> and um, Scrum is is the one that's got a lot of uh, uh, focus right now. That are more on the on the planning, project management, um, and communication side. And that's kind of represented by the yellow circle outside. Uh, we we firmly believe that you 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 can't project manage yourself um, your way to agile. And actually, these two these two things work together. And so, if you really truly want to get all the, the benefits of speed and quality and responsiveness that you get out of agile development, you need to have a uh, a, a hardcore of engineering practices surrounded by um, all of the good project management and communication practices. Now, it turns out that <clears throat> for the most part. In the distributed context, the things that change the most are the ones in the um, in the yellow circle, the, the the project management communication practices. Because really, as a root, we've got to increase that communication so that we can increase the intimacy. Okay, so that's sort of my uh, diversion into what I mean by agile and the inspiration that we take from agile values. Um, the rest of it is, is going to go through tact some of the some of the most effective tactics. Um, that we've uh, that we've come up with so far, um, and I w there's lots of them. So I, we had to put some structure on this, and, and here's here's kind of the structure that that we're gonna we're gonna go through these things. We we kind of came up with four failure modes or four uh, common groups of things that kind of destroy intimacy. <coughs> Excuse me. And in for each of these, we're gonna look at the 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 challenge, and then we're gonna look at um, some tactics that fall into the categories of people or practice or tools for each challenge area and each of them then there will be tactics um, recommended to that fit into those categories to, to increase intimacy uh, that sounds complicated I think it'll be simplified with a picture so let's look at the first one here you'll see we've got um, communication is the problem area uh, there's people things you can do there's process things you can do and there's tool things you can do that will serve the end goal of addressing the failure mode of, of declining communication, if that makes sense. So we're going to go through uh, communication, trust, delivery, and visibility as the four common failure modes. Okay. So, uh, and just so you know, we're not going to have time to hit um, all of these tactics. We're just going to sort of highlight the ones that have been most impactful um, and save the rest for later. Okay. First one, redundant roles. Okay, so um, one of the things we have found effective is to, um, especially when you're working with teams that are distributed across a lot of geographies and are needing to stretch their working hours in order to um, find time to communicate in real time, we tend to do a little bit more mirroring of roles in each site. So you can sort of imagine drawing a line down the middle of this chart and uh, one team, say the team on the top half of that line is uh, project man the, the project manager and everything above it is located in, I don't know, Toledo. And the project manager and everything below it is located in Bangalore. And you'll see that there's, there's actually um, a, quite a bit of extra overhead. If it, you, I guess the way I describe it is if you, if you imagine you had 
um, a, a team of, of six developers. Uh, if that six developer team was just sitting there in, in Toledo all together, you might have six developers, you might have uh, a couple of business analysts and, and maybe a tester, maybe a project manager, so a total of 10 or 11 people. If you then put uh, four of those developers in, uh, in Bangalore, you're going to need to add at least another extra business analyst, and if not two, uh, and then probably another person playing a project management or coordination role, possibly an extra tester. So you end up um, adding additional overheads. And what those overheads do is they, they contribute to that communication pipeline. Um, they cover for one another when people get tired or burned out by the, the, the long uh, hours and the, and the tough pace. Um, some people will take the morning shift and some people take the evening shift, so people don't have to burn the candle at both ends. Um, this, you know, th this, this model we, we find to be pretty, pretty critical in, in, in creating a sustainable pace and, a, and an effective, uh, intimate communicating team over the long haul. You don't need it. I mean, if you're, if you're just going to do a, a three-month project, everyone can get their teeth and, teeth and make it happen. But if you're investing for, the, for really making, uh, establishing a team that's going to run for a while and, and, and get to know each other and work together, uh, we recommend a pretty, and you're distributed massively in time zones, we recommend a, a pretty high degree of, of mirroring and overlap in roles. Um, it's interesting. If, you have, if you're structurally more uh, intimate, so for example, uh, say you're doing your short development between, uh, say, New York and Brazil, uh, if you uh, are doing that, you, we find that you don't need as much mirroring of, of roles. There, there's less, uh, there's less of the extra overhead required. It's probably still incrementally greater than everybody sitting in one room, um, but it's it's uh, it's not the the less structural intimacy you get, the, the more you have to do a little bit more investment to bridge that gap. I guess that's the point I'm trying to make there. Right. Let's look at the next one. The daily stand-up. One of the main, one of the common questions we get uh, when we're kind of launching a, a new distributed agile project with the customers: Hey, are we, how, how do we do stand-ups? Are we going to do daily stand-ups? And uh, the answer is, yeah, we we really do recommend that we, you, you do them and find a way to continue doing them even even when you're distributed. Um, you know, this this becomes such a heartbeat of a, a project. There's 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 so much uh, context that gets shared, and it, it just becomes kind of a milestone marker that, of, of, hey, another day has passed, right? Um, we have a lot of teams that have decided that the stand-up is so important that they're going to invest it, the time. Uh, it's not actually expensive anymore, but they're, they're going to invest the time required to set up video conference and, and do their daily stand-up um, over video. Uh, we, we have a lot of teams who do a, um, a daily uh, you know, distributed stand-ups of so team people representatives from from all the work sites, both or all three, or all four, whatever it is. Uh, but then a lot of times they'll also have uh, a second stand-up that's just internally with their own team, um, and uh, they, they, the, the topics you cover are slightly different. You know, you, you adjust the topics to to make sure you're you know you're not wasting people's time. You're telling people what 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 they need to know, and it's it's appropriate for the audience that's attending. Uh, I think that's one of the keys to making stand-ups work, actually, is, is being aware of, of who's there, and you're, you shouldn't just be saying what you think is interesting, but what you, what you think is important for, for them to know. Uh, not every team does a stand-up every day. Uh, it sort of sort of depends on how fast things are moving and how big the team is and how long they've been together. Um, and I guess my, 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 last, my last recommendation about stand-ups is don't be too dogmatic about the format. Um, be clear on the objectives, which are really to clear roadblock blocks and share relevant context and let the, the format kind of evolve over time because it keeps it fresh and keeps people engaged in, in coming to stand up, um, which, again, to say, is a, is a really important thing to find a way to make happen in a distributed context because it's a forced communication uh, time. Even if you don't talk the rest of the day, you got to be at stand up. So that's important. Um, I'm going to mention remote pairing. This, this is kind of an interesting one because it's not applicable to all contexts. And in fact, um, we at ThoughtWorks, this is kind of new to us because most of, until recently, all of our distributed development was was massively time zone uh, um, separated. Um, but since we opened ThoughtWorks Brazil, we we've, we've been able to experiment with this, and and we've actually found some decent success. Um, Using just simple tools that are publicly available, like Skype and a, and a, a remote Windows login or, or a WinViewer kind of tool. Um, these these pictures here are actually 
funnily enough, the guy with the Brazilian flag on his head is a developer sitting in San Francisco. And the other picture on, on the left of, of all the people are, that's in our office in Puerto Alegre. And they, um, they pair for about four hours a day, uh, remote pairing. They do proper ping pong pairing, shifting, shifting off the driver and the, and the sort of uh, navigator. And uh, I, I, by all reports, the team has found it to be uh, a pretty good approximation of, of side-by-side pairing. It's, and it's obviously not, not quite as rich, uh, but you know, it, it, does, it is one of those uh, activities that um, it, it, it's core to the outdoor practice, and you have to sacrifice it when, you, when you're 12 time zones apart. So you know, this is an advantage of being, being structurally more intimate you know, that, that I would recommend you take, take advantage of if you can. Uh, another sort of thing to think about, uh, if you can't be structurally intimate, right, if your development team happens to be on the other side of the planet, um, in, in pairing is a really rich uh, commu- mode of communication, right? Writing code together is, uh, a lot of people don't necessarily think about it like having a conversation or talking on the phone, but uh, it is a way to, you know, describe your thoughts and share and, and uh, iterate back and forth and, um so if you have the opportunity during the course of your project to be face-to-face for um, a week or a few days, carve out time. If you're, if, make sure your developers can carve out time to pair with one another when they're together. I think there's often, um, there's often a temptation to spend the time when you're on site uh, or, or visiting an offshore development center, spend the time in meetings all the time, right, and, you know, hashing through issues and talking and talking and talking. But um, I think it's it's really an opportunity missed if, if developers don't take the opportunity to sit down and pair on whatever's going on um, at, at when, they're, when they're physically together because that's one of the, the richest kinds of communication that, that you could have, and that will just build up that intimacy more and more. Tools. Okay, I'm not going to go into uh, a huge amount of details on tools. We actually... I think on our website, there's a you can find a link to we did a whole two-part webinar series on tools for distributed agile. So we wanted tons of detail there and, and what our recommendations were and what are some good ones and what are some um, some new ones that you should think about trying. Um, tools have really really come along since I started doing this. Um, we used to kind of make fun of video conferencing because it was always you know it took more time to set it up than it took to have the video conference, and you always had to call a tech in. And, and then it never worked, and people would just get frustrated. And if it happened to work, everyone spent time making faces at each other. It's not like that anymore. It's it's you know usually one click. It, it usually works. It's free. It's to the desktop. Uh, the quality is good, and uh, it is definitely worth investing in, in figuring out how to make video conferencing work. Um, there's also a place for social networking. Um, there's uh, you know there, there's a, there's a place for uh, certainly, Wiki is another kind of online collaboration tools and platforms. Um, probably worth pointing out that great communications infrastructure, like higher quality phones than uh, you might normally invest in, make a huge difference. You're spending thousands and thousands, hundreds, millions of dollars on uh, you know this, this remote or distributed development strategy, and you go for cheap phones. It's uh, it's a big mistake, and you'd be surprised how many organizations make it. One of the first things we often do when we go in is to Recommend some hardware purchases um, just to, to increase the um, the uh, quality of communication and remove barriers. Okay, um, those that's kind of I'm going to leave it leave it there for the communication ones. Move on to team behaviors, and the first one we want to look at is um, agile principles. This these twelve actually come from uh, the XP book. It's kind of one of the overlooked parts of, of XP. We're not going to focus on all 12. We're going to look at one, because I think this one principle, if you had to distill all of them down to the most important one that influences success in distributed gigs, is, is this one. Uh, create an environment and support and trust people to get the job done. That word trust is so huge. There's, there's often a, um, you know, one of the consequences of low intimacy, low communication is, is low trust. And you know, if, if you don't give people the benefit of the doubt, it it just saps morale, it saps productivity, it, it, it kills energy. And uh, way too often um, we find poisonous environments that have, that have grown up because people have violated this principle. So if you can find a way to, to, to keep reminding yourself of this, paste it up in a cube wall or something. Hopefully if you're doing it, you won't have a cube wall. But <laughs> find it somewhere that you can... Uh, you can you can remind yourself to um, to treat other people that you don't see very very often as, as uh, human beings that that really want to uh, work hard and succeed with you. 
Okay, I'll get off that high horse and move on to uh, another tangible practice. Um, cross pollination. This is a term we use for um, visits, and it's we we don't just call them visits. We call them cross pollination because it's actually really important to uh, have everybody get into each other's world. Uh, go and have you know certainly your remote team come and, and visit your your sites or go visit the various work sites in your project, and then go and have you go and visit them, and them come and visit you. You I mean just move it around, cross pollinate. There is uh, there is nothing like a human being to carry uh, and transmit information. You know, you spend 10 minutes with with a, a person talking to them and listening to them, and um, it, it, it could be you know a 20 page document that you wouldn't read, and and, and you get more out of that that 10 minutes of, of, of talk. So a visit uh, both ways is, is extremely key. And one rule of thumb that we like to keep in mind is this should happen pretty frequently. Um, if if it's been more than Mm, more than 10 or 12 weeks since somebody has gone to somebody else's home location, uh, you start to see a, a, a distinct fall off of, of, of trust and intimacy and richness and communication. So rule of thumb, uh, every quarter somebody better get out of their home world and go and live in somebody else's for a while. When you do go and live in somebody else's world for a while, um, you know, it's a big investment of time and travel um, and money and hassle and all these other things. So uh, it is kind of, don't, you know, if you can, by all means go. If it's been too long, just go, even if there's no special reason to go. But if you have to make a case for your travel or if you have, to, if you have some flexibility about when you go, go at the right time. And a great time to go is when there's uh, a rich, you know, a rich collaborative uh, high context event going on, uh, and in a natural development process, release planning is a really good one. So, release planning is um, a time during a self agile software development when people kind of stop, um, collect all the various you know, bits that have gotten uh, that have come up during the last few weeks. That you know, the new scope, the the, the pieces that haven't been completed, the uh, the revisions, the questions, the bugs. I don't know. You collect everything together and kind of relay it out of the table and resort the priority and and make the plans for the next you know two or three weeks or months or however however frequency you, you do your release planning. Um, if you can figure out a way to do as much of that release planning um, co-located as possible. It's a really, really good time for really good, rich conversations and trust building. So, um, other other good times to travel. Um, I mean, at, during a release, because you know uh, that's that's a great time for people to kind of go through an experience of getting the software out together. Um, when there's a crisis, um, that's a great time to travel because you know getting through the crisis and solving it uh, builds trust, builds relationships, and builds intimacy. Okay, we're gonna look at practices for visibility here. Um, under the tools side, there are um, there's a lot more than there used to be in this space. When I when I first started uh, doing distributed development, we were using spreadsheets, um, and I am now convinced I don't know how we did it. Management by spreadsheet is death. I mean, it's it's bad enough on a on a co-located project when you know some. One person has the the master spreadsheet or the the, you know, the key project documents or Gantt chart or whatever it is on their laptop, and no one else can know when it changes or see or update it or or or, or, or you know get a copy of it. Uh, if you if that person happens to sit in a different country, I mean, the, the visibility just plummets, and, and visibility is is a pretty key thing to de-risk um, distributed projects. So, um, <laughs> so I guess. And actually, I, I, actually, I will tell the story. We have a little bit of time. When, when I first came to Bangalore, there was, there was a guy here who had, had been doing it for 10 years already. And when he started, and I was complaining that we were still using spreadsheets, he told me when he started, they were using fax machines and mail. So they were mailing boxes of requirements documents. It took three weeks to mail them to Germany. And then when there were questions, there was no emails. <laughs> they were clarifying and communicating um, via faxing documents and sketches and, and, and things to one another. So um, we've, <laughs> we have come a long way since then. There's, there's you know, really rich collaboration platforms that really de-risk distributed development. Um, this, the shot on the screen right now is, is one of them. It's, uh, this is one that uh, is called Mingo. It's produced by ThoughtWorks. Uh, and so we're familiar with it. We're, we, we think it works well. We built it actually to solve this problem. 
Um, it, it, but, you know, it's not the only one. There's, there's others out there. Uh, when you're choosing one, look for something that really is, is highly visual. Uh, it's real time. It's accessible from anywhere. You know, so web-based or software as a service solutions are good. Um, that ensures that the whole team, wherever they may be, have one common view of the status and progress, and, the, and there's really nowhere to hide um, uh, when things aren't going right. So uh, some appropriate tools for collaboration and tracking. Um, you know, that, that's a space that's really advancing these days, and you should take advantage of it. Um, metrics become a lot more important. I mean, metrics and tools become more important in um, in creating the visibility that builds trust in the distributed team. Um, so, you know, when you when people can't see how their team working, they, for some reason, a lot of people freak out about that. And, uh, they don't get that sense of security and that constant feedback that, oh, yeah, there are fingers on keys, keyboards. Um, so metrics can help to plug that gap. You'll be, if you do Agile or have, you know, read and learned about Agile, you'll be familiar with a lot of these types of, you know, burn-up charts and, and, and progress graphs and things like that. Um, this is really powerful stuff because it, it, it's, it's, it's expressed in a, um, a, a, a simple way and it, it's a language that's, that's uh, familiar to everyone in the project there's, there's, and it's, it's very clear. There's no, there's no question about interpretation and, and people estimating what percentage complete they are. It's, it's a question of is this done or is it not? And, uh, and it's, it's tracked at a very granular and binary level. If you, if you use one of those tools, like um, well, these are actually all generated out of Mingle. So if you, if you use a tool that allows you to track and manage uh, your features or stories or whatever you call them at a very granular level, you can automatically, literally in real time, generate um, dashboards and project status reports that you know, can replace some of that sense of security that gets lost when you can't see your team working anymore. Um, so, if you, uh, yeah, that's probably all there is to say about that. But it, it's worth investing in getting the tools and reporting right. Okay, so we're we're kind of um, rolling up to the end. There's just a couple more slides here, but uh, the key point here is we've looked at a number of different tactics, and um, there are a lot more. Um, there's, you, I, you know, can, you, the trick is to just keep on uh, layering them on. Get put a layer on, establish them, and then figure out where your next problem is, and uh, invent some tactics or use some of these that'll address that problem. Uh, layer that on. Use as many as necessary. And in fact, use, use more because at, at some point, um, you know, people get kind of bored and stale and like like to try new things and, and, and have a change. So introduce a new way to collaborate, a new way to communicate. Uh, sometimes is just novel, and that novelty in itself encourages people to try it. So uh, on our teams, we just we keep making tweaks and changes, even if there's not an explicit problem. But that seems to keep things fresh. Um, and let's see, to make this a little bit more useful today, I've got one last kind of model for you. You, you, you know, as you think about the work you're doing, um, you might ask yourself, well, how many, how many, how much structural, how much intimacy do I need, right? And do, do I need to, oh my God, am I doing something that, that's, I should be doing nearshore or I should be all co-located or, uh, you know, do I need to do all of these tactics to get my intimacy up? Uh, well, it turns out that for, there are lots of you don't need maximum intimacy for everything. You know, there's um, there are there, there's a, there's a spectrum that, that you, the type of th challenge that you're trying to face, the type, type of thing you're trying to produce, requires more or less intimacy. And uh, what we've kind of put here is some of the main factors that seem to influence whether or not you're going to need a, a high a highly intimate um, and, and uh, highly intimate team, or you can get away with a, a less intimate team. So, for example, if you look at your delivery process for Cherry, um, if, if, you know, the way you build software is different every time. It's kind of immature. It's, uh, it's, it's random. It's ad hoc. Even if you're all sitting in the same building and you can't stay on the same page, um, you're going to want to go with a slightly more intimate model <laughs> um, because taking that ad hoc, uh, you know, possibly even randomized process and, and inserting this, con this, this um, aspect of, of people being in a different location, um, it's just going to multiply your risk, you know, beyond, you know, beyond the safe level. However, if you're you're pretty disciplined, uh, you have a consistent approach. Everyone uses the same terms and languages, and is more or less on the same pages. Has been doing it for a while. Uh, ideally, it's agile. Then um, probably you can get away with a less intimate approach. You can you can uh, you can you can make it work. Um, I'm not going to go through each of these. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put up um, some different. 
uh, descriptions of where people might be on each of these, uh, on the spectrum, on each of these factors. And you can kind of look through it and think to yourself um, what the implications might be in your organization. So to, just to, to bring it to life with a little bit of a, um, an example, imagine you're in a situation where you're, I don't know, you're a, you're a startup. Um, you've got a, a fairly immature delivery process because you've never, you've never built anything before. Uh, you've just engaged uh, a new vendor uh, who you've never worked with before, so you don't necessarily know or trust each other. Uh, you're building new, a new product, which is highly evolutionary. It's never been built before. The ideas are evolving quickly, and you've got to get something out the door in three months. If you are located in, I don't know, Austin, Texas, and you decide that you, the team you're going to bring on board is in, um, I don't know, Beijing, you're not setting yourself up with the right level of intimacy that, that you need structurally. Uh, you may you want to look at a, a, a near shore or a co-located team, and you'll want to do it. I most uh, and certainly encourage you all to keep experimenting because every little incremental bit of intimacy uh, in the long run it really does help. So I wish everyone the best of success and I thank you for your time.